Hey everybody, it's Chris Guns. Today my guest is Mr. Steve Lott. Steve Lott can speak about many things. Today I want to talk to him about his relationship with Mike Tyson. Him and Mike were actually really close when Mike was young. They were actually roommates from 1985 to 1987. Unless my information's wrong, but I'm excited to talk about this guy. He's got a lot to talk about. Today we will focus on his relationship with Mike Tyson up till about the, the Michael Spinks fight, and then we'll continue it another time. But I can't wait. Let's get him on the line. Mr. Steve Lott. Thank you. Steve Lott, thanks for joining us here at PBI Radio. It's a pleasure to have you on. You, Chris. I wanted to get into your relationship with Mike Tyson. You, when was the first time you heard the name Mike Tyson and who told you about him? Uh, Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton were uh, running the company Big Fights in New York. That was the company that owned all the fight films in the world. They were also funding, they were paying the expenses for the training camp that Customato had up in Catskill, New York. And every year or so, Cus would call and say, hey, I've got a kid, he's going to be great. And uh, Bill and Jim probably said, Terrific cuss, we'll keep sending him money. That happened for year after year after year until 1980. Uh, cuss called them and said, I got a kid, and he's going to be great. He's 13, and that kid was Mike Tyson. Uh, I did not hear of him until probably about two or three years later when Bill and just said, uh, Mike is in the amateurs and he's doing spectacularly well. And I said, terrific. You know, I wasn't that uh, thrilled or enthusiastic because all day long I was watching Muhammad Ali, Joe Lewis, and Jack Dempsey. So I was just interested because they were interested. But it was about 1980, uh, 1983. Mm-hmm. And let's go through the cast of characters. When did you first meet Gus D'Amato? Uh, I met Gus early on, uh, approximately 1973. Uh, when I began working at Big Fights for Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton, uh, he was uh, very close with Jim. Uh, they both uh, were cerebral, athletic minds to some degree. And uh, when I first met Cus, uh, I was fixing up some electronic gear, some stereo stuff in Jim's apartment. And Cus was very impressed that I could connect this stuff. I told him it's pretty simple. And uh, Cus asked me, when were you born? And I said, well, January 17th. And he said, you're okay. And I said, okay. Not till much later on did I know that he was very into astrology. And if you had a certain birth date, you were one of his favorite people. And my birth date was the same as his birth date. So what made him, I was an immediate friend to him. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, so we became friends. Once he heard that I was born on January 17th and he was born January 17th, uh, we were buddies. Uh-huh. Wow. So uh, I didn't even know that he was into astrology after all these years. I thought I read everything about him. I didn't even know that. What kind of guy was he? Was uh, he? Yeah. It, very, uh, Cus had a very low-key demeanor. Very, very warm, very low-key, uh, 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 but, but very cerebral. As you're speaking to him, you could hear his brains, uh, uh, you know, the, the brain machine working, especially when it came to boxing. Uh, his knowledge, what he thought about, what he envisioned, the way he interpreted what was happening was light years ahead of anything that was happening back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And, and primarily it was the emotional status of a fighter that even other trainers didn't even think of. And Cus knew that fighters were uh, uh, you know, determined and controlled by their emotions as well as any other endeavor, whether you're a baseball player, football player, or pianist, you have feelings, you have emotions when you perform. And Cus was one of the first people in sports to ever think that way. So in boxing, he was very cerebral. Yeah. And Bill Caton, when did you meet Bill Caton? I worked for uh, Big Fights for one year in 1967. Uh, I worked for Bill Caton and Jim Jacobs. Uh, I was the national junior handball champion was the world's handball champion. Yeah. So I asked him for a job for, the, for that year as I was going to school, and he said yes. And that's when I met Bill uh, in uh, 1967. Uh, the, together, Bill and Jim, their brain power was uh, enormous, not only in the, in the boxing film world, but when it came, of course, to fighters, when they sat down and talked about their world champions, whether it was Wilfred Benitez or Edwin 
Rosario or especially Mike Tyson. It was like having, you know, Albert Einstein and, uh, you know, Norman Mailer together talking about what to write and what to do. Incredible brain power. Yeah, and Jim Jacobs was an incredible athlete all around, huh? Incredible guy. Uh, yes, Jim um, was uh, considered at one time the world's greatest athlete. Yeah. That's what uh, Sports Illustrated wrote in the, in the, in the mid-60s. Uh, incredible handball player. A very low key, a brilliant mind, but more importantly, uh, he had a demeanor where, and I'm sure a lot of people like this, but if you make an error, whatever you do, whether you spill something or you say something or you make an error, no matter how huge it is, he says in his mind, if it was not done on purpose, you let it go. You just say, you made an error, Steve, this is what you should have done, that's it. Where most people would just blow a gasket, I know that's the way I am, <laughs> but his demeanor you could not change it in that type of regard. That t that's the type of discipline he had and the type of discipline that Custom Auto had. Yeah, so great guy. And uh, how about Kevin Rooney? And uh, Kevin was the perfect uh, trainer for Mike. Yeah. Uh, after Teddy Atlas left, Ken was a very tough guy, uh, like a taskmaster, like uh, Cuss. And, and Mike, as, as much as he was the heavyweight champion of the world in 86, 87, 88, and considered the toughest guy on the planet, he would never, ever say boo to Kevin. Uh, and actually, that's the same way he was with Caton and Jacobs. He knew that the information given to him by Kevin was absolutely 100% correct. So he and Kevin had a marvelous relationship. And Mike never, had, ever, in the gym's eye, so them worked out together from 85 to 88. Mike never spoke back to Kevin. He may have been unhappy at what Kevin said, but he never spoke back to them. Kevin had a tremendous effect on Mike, keeping Mike straight. Yeah, I, I hear a lot of different things about Teddy Atlas. What kind, what kind of guy did you think of Teddy Atlas to be? Well, Teddy was working with uh, Mike and Cus before I even got to know that they existed. Teddy was up there in 80, 81, 82, and approximately that time, uh, that's when Teddy and Cuss and Mike had that uh, altercation and, and Teddy left. So I really never was around when Teddy was uh, uh, coaching Mike or teaching Mike or training Mike in any way. Uh, but he did know Custom Auto System. That's the one thing that Cuss, Cuss's effect on trainers, that head motion and the effect of emotions on a fighter uh, Teddy did know that, but I did not know him because he was around before I got there. Yeah. So you heard of Mike in about 1980, and you met him in about 1983. What's your What's your earliest memories of when you met him, and what you thought of him when you first met him? Um, I asked Jim uh, to go drive up the Catskill one afternoon. Uh, it might have been early '84, and um, uh, we drove up there and. Uh, I settled the cuss, and Mike was there in his amateur gear, uh, uh, hitting the bag and working out. He was just a terrific kid. I, I had no idea what he would be. Mm -hmm. And realistically, neither did Jim or Bill. It was only Customato. And uh, you know, Mike was just a terrific kid. Not until about a year later, when he started coming to New York frequently, did I get a chance to know him better, and he, he moved into my apartment in, in uh, late 85. And... Um, uh, he, he was just a terrific, terrific kid. Uh, in the ring, his demeanor was one thing. Out of the ring, he was sensational, very low-key, very warm. Yeah, so he was, he was more shy and kind of antisocial, wasn't he? Well, I don't know about it. That's a good point. I don't know if he was antisocial. He was very reserved. He, he had no problem dealing with people. Uh, he never wanted to hang around people that he didn't want to hang around. He had no hangers on. He had no buddies. He had no uh, henchmen. He had no bodyguards. He would walk the streets alone. He'd go to a party alone. Everything was by himself. He did like, he loved being around people he cared about. He loved being around Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton, their wives, Doris and Lorraine, uh, Jose Torres, his friends in New York, Brian Hamill, Gallo, the author. And I would imagine... He liked being around me since he slept on the couch for almost three years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, had no, no clothes, no car, no jewelry. He was the happiest kid in the world. He was very, interestingly enough, 
his brain, even though it may not seem like this, he was very, very sharp about things he wanted to be sharp about. Uh, for example, if he was doing a commercial and he had to do a script for it, he would read it once and bingo, he would get it straight. On a TV show, on a boxing pre-fight show, on an interview show, his brain was like fantastic. Um, in terms of being uh, uh, shy, I, I, I never really saw him shy. I, I've always seen him very meek because mm -hmm. he doesn't have that demeanor out of the ring, a, a hard demeanor. I've seen him meek, but I've never seen him shy. Yeah, and what was Cus's house like when, when he'd have all those people there? Uh, when I was up there, he might have had at the time maybe three or four uh, fighters at a time up there. Of course, it was Camille. They had a, it was a huge house, a uh, big downstairs, big uh, kitchen, nice big uh, dining room, huge living room, about uh, 30 by 30 by 30, had to be maybe a thousand square feet. And upstairs, probably about four or five uh, bedrooms. A very old house off a side road, uh, perfect for uh, fighters to live in back at that time period. Fighters who really wanted to be fighters today, in today's world, 2012. I can't imagine a kid coming from any city in the world moving there and living there. It is so quiet. It's like the newsreels you see in the 20s, 30s, and 40s of Rocky Marciano living in a, a, a cabin somewhere in the woods, or Jake Lomato, or mm -hmm. Joe Lewis. So, mm -hmm. you know, the house was great back in the 60s, 70s, and when Mike was there in the 80s. But now, it would not be possible. The kids are a little too uh, city-bred uh, uh, to be in a place like that. Yeah. How, how close did you and Mike become, and what type of relationship did you guys have at its, when it was at its strongest? Was it more like father and son, or brotherly, or friends? What, what, kind of, what best describes your relationship? Well, that's a good question. I would say, I never thought of it like that. I would think it would be in between father and son and brothers. It's very rare that two guys, uh, throughout their relationship, uh, get that close. Because, you know, when you take turns crying on each other's shoulders during a, you know, two, three year period, uh, you get pretty close. Yeah. There are certain things I told Mike about that he comforted me in such a way, that, and usually it was about women. And in the other way, that happened with Mike too, with Robin Givens, when she was driving him crazy. Yeah. He came to me for support. So it was not only a friendship, but there were times that he would counsel me like he's my father even though he was much younger. <laughs> and times I would counsel him like I'm his big brother. But it, w it was very, very close. Yeah. He was never confident, they said. I heard this whole, my whole life. They said when he was an amateur, he would sometimes break into tears. And I actually saw some video in, in a documentary about Mike that he was crying, I think, in Colorado. And Teddy Atlas had to chase him and stuff. Would you travel with him when he was an amateur? And go to all his fights? I, I, yeah, I, I never traveled with him prior to his becoming professional. Uh, only when he became professional. Uh, at, you know, Mike, a very, very, uh, uh, of course, tough upbringing in Brooklyn. Uh, he was under tremendous pressure as an amateur, having, you know, having to go out there and not just perform, but really take guys out. Yeah. Cuss instilled in him that demeanor that said, Mike, if you want to be a real superstar in boxing, you got to come out there like Jack Dempsey, Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciano, all wrapped up into one. And that's what Mike did. And Mike emotionally was always a little bit behind the times. He was gathering his emotional stability. He was gathering emotional strength. And he finally started to get it when he turned pro because he handled it very well. And he was really getting into his own by the time of the Sphinx fight uh, in 88. That's when he was really putting it together, not only fending off Robin Givens, but fending off Don King and everything under the biggest fight in the history of boxing and knocking out Sphinx in 91 seconds. All of that showed me that he was developing emotionally. But that summer of 88 with Robin Givens changed all that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to get into this or not, but what did Mike tell you about the Teddy Atlas incident with the gun and how it all played out? Uh, th that's a good question. I had heard about it, but I never asked Mike about it. Actually, I've never asked Mike about Brooklyn. I've never asked him about 
uh, Teddy. Uh, in, the, in the three years he lived in my apartment, I think I drove him to Brooklyn once. Once, and that was it. But it wasn't something that, that was of interest to me uh, or that I thought would you know, uh, add to our bond in any way. If he wanted to tell me something, he'd say it. He never asked me about the Bronx or where I grew up. Uh, I was only interested in what was happening to him at that moment. And as he began as, as a professional and the fights got bigger and bigger, the, the focus on Mike, the worldwide focus, was enormous. Yeah. Well, Michael Jordan here in the United States, that, he was a big star. But worldwide, Mike was much bigger. Yeah. So everything Mike did was under a microscope. My thinking was to handle Mike and to advise Mike and to do what's best for Mike at that moment to make sure he's okay rather than going back in the past. So I, I really never asked him about the Teddy situation or, or Brooklyn. Yeah, and what was he like when he missed out on the Olympics? He's like, uh, he loves the history of boxing, and I know that it probably was important to him to make the Olympic team. Was he upset about it or sad or mad? What did he say? Uh, that's a good question. I never asked him about that. Mm -hmm. But in looking back at it, I think it was a blessing in disguise. And I'll tell you why. Uh, that team in 84 uh, debuted at Madison Square Garden. You know, Biggs and Whitaker and Meldrick Taylor and that whole group, big superstars. Yeah. And they became, they started their, their careers on ABC Sports and television. Mike, in my opinion, was not ready for that focus. He was not. He was much better off developing in upstate New York, in a small arena, for $400 a fight, to develop the emotional stability, the emotional strength that those guys had from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of amateur fights and families that protected them and families that cared for them. They had all that already. Mike did not. And while Cus was perhaps, you know, drilling Mike for the Olympics, uh, I think if Cus looked back at it now, he'd say it was probably the right thing to do. And to show you how things work out, when uh, Mike and I were in Las Vegas for the Trevor Burbick fight, when he challenged for the championship, we were driving to the uh, hotel one day for a press conference, and across the street from the Hilton was the Sahara Hotel, and Henry Tillman was headlining a show there, uh, who fought in the Olympics and, and won that year in the Olympics. His fights, the ticket prices were $15, $10, and $7.50. The Hilton Marquis, Tyson versus Burbick, ticket prices, $750, $500, $400, and down. So Cus knew that that style of being a ferocious fighter would work, but I think that Mike getting to that point, it was a blessing that he did not go to the Olympics. It, it gave him more time to develop emotionally. Yeah. Yep, and it, you you talked about it a little bit. You you and him were roommates from I think 1985 to 1987, right? Was that it? Uh, he yeah, he started late '84 coming to the city, mm -hmm. and all of '85, all of '86, and around October of '87, uh, September October, he decided he wanted to get his own apartment in the same building. I had an apartment, and Jim Jacobs had an apartment in the place in New York City, and he wanted to get an apartment in the same building to be close. So it was about maybe two and a half years. And who thought of you guys rooming together? Who, who had the idea? Well, it was by coincidence. Um, in late 84, after the Olympics, Mike turned pro. And Mike was going to be, uh, begin his pro career in late 84, but hurt his wrists in, in Catskill. So he had to come to the city to get some hand therapy for about 10 days from a very good doctor here in, in, in New York City. And Cus asked me if it's okay if Mike stayed with me, because uh, Cus knew that I was born January 17, and I was very close with Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton, so I was pretty solid. Uh, so I said to Cus, of course, that week we started to, uh, uh, he started living in my apartment, and when he turned pro uh, in early 85, he said to Cus, can I go down to Steve's apartment and hang out for a day in between each fight? He was, he was fighting every two weeks, so all he had was a day. Mm -hmm. And Cus said, absolutely positively. So in early 85, he started coming down, and he kept coming down. And eventually, it was uh, the fights were a month apart, so he could stay for two or three days. And then they were big fights, and he'd stay for a month. 
and then he was champion. Of course, he stayed for six weeks or eight weeks before each fight. So it just happened that uh, because Cus trusted me, he permitted Mike to stay in my place. Mm -hmm. And what was it like living with Mike Tyson? Did you ever have any problems with him, or was it always just easy to get along with him? Well, I, I've heard that question before. It's a, it's a, it's a great question. In the two and a half years, or almost three years he stayed there, the craziest thing he ever said to me was, Steve, how come you ate up all the vanilla ice cream? <laughs> and that was it. So, you know, you know, but you have to remember early on in early 85, uh, he would sleep on the couch. I would have the bedroom and I'd come out of my bedroom and there on the couch is my buddy, Mike Tyson, a fighter. That's cool. Terrific kid. But nobody in the world thought he would be the Mike Tyson. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Yeah. As the months went by, he was a four-round fighter, six-round fighter, eight-round fighter, ten-round fighter. And then one day I came out of my bedroom, and there on the couch is the heavyweight champion of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and not just the heavyweight champion, explosive knockout punching sensation. Yeah. So, you know, for a guy, a sports guy like me, to have the heavyweight champion of the world sleeping on your couch is like, mm -hmm. oh, cool. And the best part was, wherever we traveled together, I was never afraid of anybody. Yeah. I wouldn't be either. <laughs> now, he turned. He did turn pro in March of, of 85, and Cuss and Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton knew that the goal was to keep him in the gym and off the streets and away from trouble, not even giving him the chance to go back to the streets at all. They'd fight and go back to the gym and fight and go back to the gym. He was being groomed from the start to being a superstar athlete, not just a, a superstar boxer, but he had commercials like you well, said and yeah there was a there's a couple of factors in there the reason for fighting so often was was really not to keep mike off the streets mike was dedicated i mean he he was dedicated the reason for fighting so often was that mike had so little amateur experience like we mentioned about those amateurs in the 84 olympics who had hundreds of fights mm -hmm. that gives you a tremendous amount of experience the same in any sport mike did not have that so Cus knew that in order to get that emotional stability, Mike had to get more fights. And that was the reason of fighting so often, to get Mike that emotional experience so that when he walked into the ring each time after the fight before, he'd feel a little more secure, fight a little better guy, and fight a little better, have a wealth of uh, emotional maturity that he didn't have. So the reason for fighting so often was not as much uh, to um, keep him off the street, it was to give him that emotional stability and to reinstill every time the boxing techniques that Cus wanted him to use, that head motion, the weaving and bobbing, and the, the ferocious punching. The, the stardom portion, being a superstar, grooming him for superstar, well, that was uh, Kate and Jacobs. Uh, and the luxury that Mike had was that they were independently wealthy and had a huge company in the boxing business. So with their independent wealth, they were able to supply Mike with whatever he needed in terms of training, including sparring partners when he was an amateur that cost a thousand dollars a week, which is unheard of, mm. as grooming him for superstardom, their film company, they made sure every fight was videotaped, every fight was photographed, and with their marketing, sent the materials out to newspapers and TV stations throughout the world. This is before YouTube and emails. Everything had to be done by mail. So the marketing portion was Jim and Bill. The fight portion was Custom Auto. But the guy who had to make it happen was Mike Tyson. Yeah, it was really incredible. 1985, he turns pro in March, and he has 15 fights that, that year. 15 fights and all by knockout. That's, that's, a, that's amazing. You know? and, and from a professional perspective, what do you remember about the course of that year and how Mike changed over the course of that year. 15 fights is a lot of experience. So must have changed him a little bit. He was, yeah, he was gaining experience with the fights. Still, remember, you know, while Jim and Bill were excited mm -hmm. and Cus was thrilled and I was you know, ecstatic traveling with Mike, mm -hmm. nobody thought he would be ever anything at that point. There was no promoter that came out of the woodwork and said, I gotta get this kid, he has a million dollar advance. There was no network that came across and said, we've got to get this kid, here's a, a half a million dollars, we want to... Nobody at all did that. Until late 85, uh, early 86, when he got on the cover of Sports Illustrated, there was a little bit of buzz, 
but because of Jim, Jim and, uh, Jacobs and Bill Caton's uh, power with the networks, they got him on ABC Sports. And the thing that brought Mike to the public attention was that first big fight against Jesse Ferguson. Mm-hmm. That's when the public started to hear about Mike Tyson. But even at that point, there was no promoter that said, I got to get this kid. He was too small. He was too slow. The peekaboo won't work. All the things that Customato said will make Mike a superstar, no one else recognized. Yeah, and that first big fight was against Jesse Ferguson on big network television. He seemed to exude confidence to the cameras and the people at home, though. What did you think of his comment after the fight when he said he wanted to drive his nose bone up into his brain? Did it alarm you at all, or did you just think it was the excitement of after the fight? Well, I, I'll have to be honest. I wasn't sophisticated enough in marketing to know how detrimental that was. When uh, Bill and Jim heard that Mike say that, and worse, when they got back to their office and their marketing uh, associates reminded them of that, that was something that they were very unhappy with, and they told Mike that for your marketing, Mike, that's not something you, sh- you should do in any way, shape, or form. When I heard that, and they, they mentioned it to me that, Steve, this is the type of things that when you are with Mike alone at a fight somewhere, you've got to be cognizant. You've got to know that when Mike says something, the entire world is going to say, what was it? And in terms of marketing and commercial endorsements, his demeanor and his character has to be such that people look at him and say he's a role model. So the line about pushing the brain through Ferguson's nose was not at that level of being a hero or being marketable. So I learned something, and Mike learned something. That was something for me more important to learn than Mike because I was with Mike all the time at the fight nights with the press conferences and the interviews, and that was a very valuable learning experience for me. Mm -hmm. And at this time, was Gus sick? Was Gus able to be in Mike's corner? No, huh? He wasn't in Mike's corner. Cut, cut, yeah, Cus passed away in October of 85. That was like Mike's eighth or ninth pro fight. Oh. And uh, fortunately for Mike, Cus had uh, uh, t- uh, spoken to Mike about what could happen if he passed away. And he said, Mike, you know, I'm an old guy and I could pass away. I'm not, you know, I'm not a kid, but you'll be fine. You'll continue on and you'll be champion. And he kept telling that to Mike over and over and over. More importantly... Cus knew that if he himself worked the corner, that when he, da- when he died, if, Cus- if Mike looked up and Cus was not there, it might be an emotional hit for Mike in some way. So Cus decided early on, from the very first fight, not to work the corner. Not mm-hmm. even in the amateurs. He did not want to work the corner. He knew that it would be best for Mike so that eventually, when Cus had passed away, Mike would not see any difference in his immediate frame of view from the corner and that's exactly what happened Cus passed away and about five days later Mike had a fight in um, uh, Texas and we went there uh, Mike blew the guy out a guy named uh, 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 Richardson and he continued on he, he knew that what Cus had told him would be exactly correct and it was correct yeah in my in my memory and I, I know I forgot a lot more than I probably remember even but I always thought Gus died in November of '86. I always thought that. I don't know why. Yeah, it was a. a yeah, it was a year earlier. It was '85. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, all of the big fights Mike had in, in, in late '85, early '86, like the Ferguson fight, uh, he was already passed away. The cover of Sports Illustrated, he had passed away. Yeah, okay. So uh, uh, he missed all that great stuff. Uh, he still would have been very stern with Mike about the way Mike fought. Interestingly enough. As great as Mike was when you watched him on TV, all those fights, knockout after knockout, sensational knockout, sensational, Mm -hmm. beating Burbick in two rounds, the victory over Smith, knocking out the former champs, Pinklin Thomas, beating Tucker, then knocking out Biggs and Holmes and Tubbs and Spinks. Cuss would not have been happy. And I'll tell you why, because I had this conversation with Mike about about six months ago. I said, Mike, you know, every one of those fights you fought, when you were champion, you never fought as well as you did in the gym. Mm. You never slipped, slipped, slipped. You never came up weaving, punching, and weaving. You never did that stuff, and you still blew out everybody. <laughs> and he looked at me, he said, you know, you're right. So, 
Cuss would have been on Mike, even though Mike blew out everybody, became the youngest champion of all time, the world's most popular athlete. Cuss would have been on Mike. Mike, you're not slipping, you're not weaving, you got to do this. So uh, uh, Cuss would have been that way with Mike from the very beginning as he was to the very end. Yeah, bring me back to when Mike heard that Gus passed away. What was he like, and what was the getting over it like? Um, I, I met Mike at the hospital here in New York uh, at Mount Sinai, and Mike was very sad. Uh, he, you know, he was with uh, Jose Torres, and uh, when uh, the uh, Gus had not passed away when they were there, but he and Jose walked out and, and, and walked together. I was not with them. Um, all I know is that after Cus passed away, uh, Mike held it together. Uh, you know, there are photographs of Mike at the funeral in upstate New York, and uh, he was holding it together. Uh, it was very tough for him, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know what he did when he was by himself. I don't know how he handled his emotions. But in the public eye, he, was, he, he handled it uh, like a champion. Yeah. He knocked out his uh, next opponent, Steve Zuski, after the Jesse Ferguson KO. His record was 19-0 and with 19 knockouts, and then came Quick Tillis. He went the distance, and Mike's, Mike, Mike actually knocked down Quick Tillis in round four, and that saved him from getting a draw on the scorecards. What did Mike think about that fight and going the distance for the first time? It's a, that's an interesting era. Uh, that, that was a key fight. Uh, it was key because... After the Zowski fight, in the locker room after the Zowski fight, Mike's ear was like a little balloon. And the commission doctor said, you better get this checked out. There's something wrong here. The next day in New York City, we bring him to a very famous uh, uh, ear doctor. And the doctor said, we got a serious problem here. His cartilage in the ear is infected. And you got to get him right to the hospital. He could lose the ear. What happened was Mike was in his pigeon coop, fell down, hit his ear, and got infected. Mike went into the hospital for two weeks in a hyperbaric chamber every day where they force uh, penicillin and antibiotics into your system. The ear was fine. He went back to training. He should have had a warm-up fight before the Tillis fight. He should have had a fight in there with another rather easy opponent. Tillis was too good at that point, in my opinion, now looking back. But fortunately, as you said, he did score the knockdown. He did go the 10 rounds. It did give him tremendous... Uh, emotional strength, uh, confidence to know he could go 10 rounds and look at the fight and say, you know what? I had a lot left. I could have done better. And he did the next fight with, uh, with uh, Mitch Green. He cruised through that fight. But that Tillis fight was a very big turning point for Mike to give him more confidence. Yeah, so after going the distance uh, the second time in a row with Mitch Green, did that, did that, did he, did he gain strength through that too? Or was he starting to get, you know, like, wondering why his power wasn't following with him? Did he think uh, his power might have diminished or something at the higher level? Well, you know what? I know Mike could probably put on a face or be a actor if he wanted to. But in the uh, after-fight interview in the ring with Larry Merchant from HBO, Mike was, was delighted that he went 10 rounds. He, he was almost pleased he went to 10 rounds. Because I think in his mind he said, you know, I could use another 10-rounder to get even more confidence, and that's exactly what happened in the fight. I don't think for one second my question is power in any way. It's like a, a, a batter, you know, a, a Mickey Mantle or Willie Mays. They strike out a couple of times. There, the next time, and say, you know what? I've lost my swing. It just doesn't happen. It didn't happen with Jack Dempsey <laughs> when he went uh, a few rounds with uh, Gibbons. It didn't happen with Joe Lewis. And Tommy Farr, it didn't happen with uh, Rocky Marciano and, uh, uh, you know, uh, La Starza. Those guys, they keep that confidence deep down. And the same with Mike. He knew he was still a tremendous puncher. Yeah, and he got back on the winning track by knockout, scored six more knockouts in a row before getting the shot at Trevor Burbick. But right before that fight, I, Mike Tyson said he caught gonorrhea, and he fought that fight with gonorrhea. What do you remember about that fight, though? He looked sensational. He said that he was happy that the fight didn't go long because he didn't think he could he could fight well through a, a long-distance fight. What, what do you remember about that night in that fight? 
Well, actually, uh, it, w it wasn't that fight that he got the gonorrhea. It was two fights later, the Pinklin Thomas fight. No. Um, yeah, the, the Burbick fight, he was fine. Um, we were there for the, the six weeks. Uh, the only unusual thing about that fight was that uh, I got drilled a little bit from the, uh, the managers. As we were leaving for the arena from the house we were living in, uh, Kevin, Mike, and I, as we were walking out the door, we had to be in the uh, locker room a few minutes later, Mike said he was hungry. And Kevin and I looked at each other and said, well, Mike, you know, we got to go to the, the arena. We're ready to, to get to the locker room. He said, I'm hungry. So I said, okay. I sat him down, started to make him some spaghetti, boiled the water. Mm -hmm. He ate. We got to the arena. When I walked into the locker room, Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton gave me a stare that you, like, right there and then are like bullets. Right in, he's, Jim came up to me, Steve, you were supposed to be here a half hour ago. I said, Jim, Mike and I and Kevin were leaving. He said he was hungry. I had a choice. Bring him here directly or make him some spaghetti and then come here. What should I have done? He said, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the big thing that happened uh, for that fight. Uh, the, the lesser thing that was interesting was it was Mike's championship fight. I never really asked him how he felt about Burbick as a fighter. So the day before the fight, we were driving, he and I, and I figured, let me ask him an unusual question, and I'll probably get the correct answer. And I asked him, Mike, what do you think Cuss would say about this guy? And Mike said, w what do you mean? I said, well, Cuss, how would he describe Burbick? And Mike thought for a second and said, uh, he probably would say he's a tomato can. <laughs> now, when I knew that Mike would think Cuss would say that, then I knew that in Mike's mind, he thought that also. So it kind of took Mike out of his own mentality, but gave him a very objective view. So once he told me that, I knew he really wouldn't have any problem in the ring emotionally with Trevor Burbick. So, uh, but that fight, he, he, was, he was really terrific for that fight. And uh, his great line, of course, in the ring after the fight was over, telling Larry Merchant that, you know, Custom is looking down, mm -hmm. telling all the great fighters in history, my boy did it. Yeah, that was memorable. So many memories with Mike Tyson. I think more than any other fighter, really. And, and well, yeah. Well, you know the interesting thing with Mike, the the spectrum of his life from Brooklyn as a street thug to being in '87, '88, voted the world's most popular athlete, a superstar, doing commercials on TV, a uh, spokesperson hired by the New York City Police Department, the FBI, the DEA, then the downslide with Don King to where. Finally, the prison and the ear biting and everything else. And now coming back up with the Hangover film, mm -hmm. the iPhone application, the shows on Broadway in Las Vegas, that spectrum from down to up to down to up. You know, I'm not a great historian, but I, I don't know anybody in the history of the world that, that lived through that spectrum. Yeah, yeah. And, and did you catch his show? Yes, I saw it here in Las Vegas. Uh, incredibly entertaining. No. So it's for a young audience. There's a lot of vulgarity in it. <laughs> Talks about his entire career. Uh, the audience here, you know, is a 20-year-old to 30-year-old audience that, that love the show. Standing ovation. And, uh, you know, his life is very, very interesting. It's not like saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a, a car mechanic in, in North Dakota. I'm Mike Tyson. Here's what's happened. So it was very entertaining. Mm -hmm. And after he won his championship against Trevor Burbick, he said, Mike said that he actually went to Brooklyn and got into trouble and actually mugged an old lady. Did you know anything about that? I would think that that's not true. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. Mike adored being a hero. I've seen him, uh, when he wasn't looking at me, I've seen him standing with the belt around his waist in front of a mirror, adoring being champion, adoring being a hero knowing that he was doing commercials on TV. So while that sounds good, that he went back to Brooklyn and mugged a person, I couldn't believe it for a second, not for a second. It sounds Hollywood style, but it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then he unified with a decision win over James Bone Crusher Smith, who earned the name Bone Clutcher Smith for holding so much. But now he had the WBC championship at the time. And from, from the time you met Mike till that point, did he change at all, or did he? Did you see anything changing about him? His personality. Um, that's an interesting point that I hear all the time. That either the mics changed, either his the 
pressure got to him, or and then he started to fail, or the money got to him, or he started to fail, or Customato got to him dying, and he started, and none of that is true. Mike won the championship in '86 against Burbick, and was sleeping on my couch, and he's making millions of dollars a fight. No car, no jewelry, no clothes. He beat the fighter that you mentioned, uh, James Bunkersher Smith. Went back to sleeping on my couch, no car, no jewelry, no clothes. Fight after fight after fight. Uh, He got better and better in the ring. He obviously got better out of the ring because when you're hired by the New York City Police Department, as he was, uh, to be a spokesperson, you really don't have a bad reputation. You've got to be pretty good reputation. Same thing with the FBI, DEA commercials he did. They don't usually hire guys who have a problem with their personality. So Mike got better and better and better, not until Don King and Robin Givens. That Mm -hmm. line of demarcation, the summer of 88, did he change? Absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. But isn't it interesting that it didn't happen before being the youngest heavyweight champion of all time or making millions of dollars a fight or being under more pressure than perhaps any other athlete in the history of the world? No problem until that summer of 88. Yeah. And after defending those titles... With a KO win over Pinklin Thomas, he unified all three belts with a decision win over Tony Tucker. But there was still Michael Spinks out there. Did it bother Mike that that people actually thought Michael Spinks would beat him? Did he have a kind of a grudge going into that fight with Michael Spinks? No. Um, interestingly enough, Mike was very uh, uh, cerebral about fighting someone. He knew that it was an opponent. He knew that he had a win. He knew he wanted to put on a show. He knew that the other guy would have to kill him before Mike would, would lose. But it was not like something that Mike said to the managers ever. You know, I got to fight this guy because people are saying this or people are saying that. He would never do that. As a matter of fact, it was the opposite. When he was asked after any fight, perhaps even, I think even after the Holmes fight in the ring, they asked him, who do you want to fight next? And Kevin and, and uh, Mike said, hey, I'm just a fighter. The managers, Jim and Bill, you you asked them, I'm just a fighter. They determined who I fight. He knew that that was the way a professional demeanor, a professional thinking process would take place. The one thing he didn't want to do is present himself in a fashion that people would say, wow, pretty, you know, he, he thinks he's the man. He knew that Jim and Bill knew much more than he did. He knew that Kevin Rooney knew much more than he did. And when you conduct yourself like that, it's the same as being president president of the United States. You have a board of advisors of 66 guys and women who have PhDs in every facet of walk of life. That's what he had with Bill and Jim. So there was never a time when he thought that someone out there was bugging him as a fighter in any way. He always relied on the managers to make those decisions. Mm-hmm. October 16th, 1987, Mike fought Tyrell Biggs. And Mike said that in that fight, he had uh, beautiful woman, uh, women on three of the four sides of the ring. He was dating Naomi Campbell, and he had her on one side of the ring. He was dating Robin Givens, and he had her on one side, and he had another beautiful model or something on the other side. Did you know he was out of control like that when it came to women? I have to ask you, what, what do you mean by the word out of control? Well, that it takes a lot of a lot of kutzva, I guess, <laughs> to to have three ladies in in a building at once, and to think you could balance them. <laughs> well, let's put it this way: I don't think that. I, was, uh, to be honest, I don't know if Mike actually asked them to travel down to, oh, okay. to watch the fight. Uh, I would think that independently, they said, "Mike, I'm coming to see your fight. How do I get a ticket?" Mm-hmm. Now, being asked that question by each one. He's not going to say to them, you can't come. So he, he, they, they did get tickets from Bill Caton. They were at the fight. Bill carefully and calculatingly uh, put them in different quadrants of the, of the arena. And interestingly enough, when the uh, fight was over and we went back to the apartment, the house to change, to go back to the after fight party, uh, Mike looked at me and said, I'm not going. I said, uh, why not? And he said, I don't feel like going. I'm just going to stick around here. I said, okay, not until I realized that Bill never told me that the women were there in the arena, not until after the fight we got back to New York. And I realized that if Mike went to the after-fight party, uh, he'd have to say hello to one of them and make 
that one woman, his main woman for the evening, that would have been World War Three. <laughs> so uh, he decided not to go, and that was the wise choice. Yes, it was. And did he, did he leave with Robin Givens that night? I don't, I don't know. I thought I thought I heard him someone say that he left with Robin that night, but he did marry her. And what did you think of that? Him. Well, yeah, before they were married, Robin was kind. She was warm. She was caring. Whenever I wanted to find out where Mike was, if he was out, Steve, here he is. Here's the number. Wonderful. I didn't know that uh, she was going to tell Mike that she was pregnant when she never was, mm. just to marry Mike to get his money. I never knew that. I wouldn't dream that. But that's exactly what happened. Uh, she and her mother planned a scam on Mike that was one of the great scams of all time. And uh, Mike fell for it. I fell for it. They got married. And the moment they got married, her demeanor changed overnight. Mm. I'm Mrs. Mike Tyson, she announced. I'm taking over. And that was scary. Uh, you know, I knew that Jim and Bill could handle it. I knew that I could handle it. But I was more concerned about Mike. Because I knew he wanted a family. I knew he thought he wanted to settle down. I felt that it would be make him more of a, um, uh, give him more uh, 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 confidence. It would give him more stability. It would make him a better person, make him a better fighter. But Robin's choice, Robin's uh, focus was not that. Her focus was to get Mike's money. And that summer of 88 was a disaster for everyone. Right after the Spinks fight, Everything that she was doing was behind Mike's back to such a degree that Mike had no idea she was planning all this stuff. And one of the touchstones to that that tells me or anyone looking at the situation that that's exactly what was happening. The day before the Sphinx fight in 1988, uh, Mike had a dear friend, Rory Holloway, who wanted to do a Mike Tyson merchandise line of T-shirts and hats. And Mike told Rory, let's meet with Bill because he was a marketing expert with his advertising company. Let's go up there and meet with him. So Mike calls Bill and said, can we come over and meet with you? And Bill said, absolutely, yes. They went up to Bill's room at the Trump Plaza. Uh, Bill told Rory that he worked with them hand in hand on the merchandise line, the production, getting him into Macy's and Gimbel's and every big retailer to make sure it was a complete success. Uh, Mike was deliriously happy that Bill was going to help Rory. And Mike said, you know, Bill, anything you need from me? And they, Bill said, Mike, this is yours. And Rory, I'm delighted to help. I'm not going to be involved financially in any way. You can keep all the money. It's yours. And Mike was deliriously happy, hugged Bill, thanked him, and they left. The next night at ringside, at the Spinks tyson fight, on camera, on the pay-per-view camera, Robin Given's attorney gives Bill a legal letter that says, Bill, you're fired as manager of Mike Tyson. Now, I don't know that much about Mike and Bill, but I don't think Mike could go up to Bill's room the day before the fight and ask Bill for a big, big, huge favor for his dearest friend, knowing that the next night Bill was going to be handed a lawsuit to break the contract. Hmm. That was what going on in Robin. With no knowledge, Mike had no knowledge of that stuff. So I felt bad for Mike that all this stuff was happening, and that made Mike very, very unhappy. And that summer of 88, that's when all the stuff started to break down with the fight with Mitch Green, driving the car into the tree, and everything else. And it got worse, ending with the Barbara Walters show. Mm -hmm. And did you watch the Barbara Walters show as it happened? And what did you think of it? At the time. Yeah I, I, yeah, I watched the Barbara Walters show. At that point, uh, Robin, in that summer of 88, interestingly enough, Robin had renegotiated with Bill Caton to keep him on as manager. And, and the reason she did that was that behind her back, Don King went to Mike Tyson and said, Mike, here's a promotional agreement I want you to sign. Now that Bill Caton is out, you and me are going to be fighter, promoter. Mike gave that contract to Robin. And Robin... And her lawyers realized that if Mike signed that promotional agreement, Mike's money would be stolen completely by Don King. Hmm. And Robin knew there could only be one thief in the family. That was hmm. going to be her, Robin Gibbons. So she told Mike, do not speak to Don King ever again, which Mike obeyed. She immediately went back to Bill Caton knowing that if Bill was the manager, every penny that was going to Mike Tyson would get to Mike Tyson. And therefore, she would, she'd be able to steal it. 
Mm-hmm. So that's when we were still involved with Mike to some degree as his managers. Then the Barbara Walter show. And I knew Mike was feeling very under the uh, pressure with her that summer. But that show with her sitting next to him and her claiming that he was manic depressive and him acknowledging that on the show, that was painful to watch. Mm -hmm. Painful because I knew it wasn't true. You know, Mike lived with me for three years. Interestingly enough, he didn't show any signs of manic depression when he lived with me, being the youngest heavyweight champion of all time. Why now with Robin Givens? And the answer became obvious after the show, and they broke up, that once Mike went on national television to tell the world he was manic depressive, that Robin, having a lawsuit with Mike to break the marriage, to take all the money, no one would argue with her. Mike said it himself, he's manic depressive. That was her defense. And it worked. You know, mm-hmm. Mike and she broke up the next day, and uh, she w- took off all the money. Uh, and that was a big change in Mike's life until two days later when he was grabbed by Don King. Yeah. What, what, did you feel a strain in your relationship with Mike before he, he went with Don King, or was it after he went with Don King that you felt the strain, too? There was a strain while she was with, he was with Robin that summer of 88, because mm-hmm. uh, she wanted everyone out of Mike's life. She wanted Kate out, she wanted me out, she wanted Kevin Rooney out. She knew, like Don King later on, that in order to steal Mike's money, you have to have a fence around him. You, mm-hmm. Mike could not have his own attorneys his own advisors, his own managers, his own trainers. There's no way because they'd want to tell him right from wrong and what's best for Mike. Robin, much like Don King, only wanted to give Mike information that was best for them. So I felt that strain. I didn't know what was going to happen. I knew we were still as managers, but there was an uneasy feeling. But nothing like what was going to happen with Don King. That was a, a full frontal assault when, when Don took Mike over. That, that, that was the end right there. Mm-hmm. So Mike would continue to tell you about his problems, like like about the time he found Brad Pitt in, in the house while he wasn't there with Robin. Did he tell you about those kind of things? No. When Mike was married with Robin, mm-hmm. there was nothing that Mike and I discussed that was personal. Mm-hmm. Nothing at all. Uh, and uh, I, 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 you know, I think I mentioned one thing to Mike once while that summer of 88 that was personal. And Mike said, Steve, now I'm married. That's none of your business. I said, no problem, Mike, you got it. The one thing I didn't want to do was have a, a blow up with Mike as, you know, uh, uh, there was enough pressure being one of his assistant managers. But the stuff with, with Brad Pitt, I had no idea anything like that was going on uh, behind the scenes, nothing. Yeah, and since then, did Mike ever acknowledge that that, that car hitting the tree was a suicide attempt or was it just he was a bad driver? <laughs> uh, he, I never spoke to him about that, but mm-hmm. since I knew how he drove, he's a horrible driver. <laughs> uh, when Bill and Jim got him his first car, uh, uh, you know, when Mike was uh, uh, 18, uh, he got, in, in two days, he got a, a, car, a fender bender in New York City. I had to go over there and, and you know, bring the car to a, a shop or something. Mike can't drive at all. As great and as skillful <laughs> and as a, a ballet-like as he is as a fighter, the opposite is true of him as being a driver. He can't drive. Yeah, and after Customato did die, he did get extremely close to Jim Jacobs. And did anyone talk about the distance that was coming between you guys with with Mike after Don King came in? Did you guys all oh, stay? You, you mean well? Don became the promoter by choice of Bill and Jim in '86 with the Burbick fight. The wise choice for Bill and Jim was to get Don the promoter because uh, Don would be able to get just the right opponents under the right circumstances. But Mike and Don had no relationship together at all during that time period from 80, the Burbick fight of 86, Smith, Thomas, Tucker, Biggs, Holmes, Spinks, no relationship whatsoever. It wasn't until after Robin and Mike broke up, after the Barbara Walter show, that Don jumped in. Once Don jumped in and got Mike away to Cleveland to begin working on him psychologically, then it was over. Then there was no tension between Mike and I, there was no Mike and I, it was history. Yeah, and was it, Mike's Mike's last fight with Kevin Rooney was the Michael Spinks fight, right? Yes. That fight was huge. Take us back to training for that fight. Was, was Mike able to focus on training for that fight, or was there too many distractions outside the, 
ring for, for you to feel comfortable going into that fight? Uh, two parts. Number one, there were enormous distractions. Mm. Enormous. But for some reason, and I don't know why, Mike held it together in such a fashion that blew me away. Not only it being the biggest fight in the history of boxing at that time, but the fact that Robin was on his back every day. And uh, as a matter of fact, there was uh, just before the fight, about a week before the fight, uh, I didn't want to cause any uh, war. So whatever Robin wanted to do in terms of the press and the PR and the magazines, the interviews, whatever she wanted, that was fine. Mm -hmm. She told me that there were some interviewers coming in to speak to Mike. These are the ones that are okay, Steve. Do not let this one person speak to Mike. I said, Robin, you got it. At the training the facility that day, the two people that were okay spoke to Mike. Uh, the one that wanted to speak to Mike that was not approved, I said, sorry, can't speak to Mike. She said, okay. And Kevin and I left and, and went home. What I didn't know was that once I left, the non-interviewer, the one that was not supposed to speak to Mike, went to Mike directly and, and spoke to Mike. Mm. I got a call at the house saying from Robin, and she went off on me as if there was a, a you know, as if I, uh, I did the worst thing in the world. She used language with me every, every vulgar term in the world. And I was concerned because she told me that when Mike comes home, he's going to, well, I don't want to use the words, he was going to get rid of me. He was going to do something to me that uh, he was going to uh, bust me up. And all, I, I was concerned. When Mike got home that afternoon, he didn't say a word to me. He went right to his room, and I was concerned. I told Kevin, look, this is what happened. I heard Mike in the ro his room yelling and screaming at Robin, saying, Robin, stay out of our business. It's none of your business. So right then and there, I knew, I guess I wasn't going to get killed right away. <laughs> he left his room, walked out of the apartment, and about 10 seconds later came back. Says, Steve, let's go for a walk. Now... If he had said, here's a billion dollars, it would not have been as strong and as personal and as warm to me as saying, let's go for a walk. We walked. He said, Steve, man, look, you, you know, Robin, you, you, you know, you're my brother, man. You don't worry about what she says. Once he said that, I was thrilled. He said, Steve, man, look, you know, she doesn't know the business. You're my brother. Everything's cool. You know, Steve, the first time she yelled at me, I felt like that, too. So I know how you feel. Walked to the hotel, dropped them off, everything was cool. That's the type of composure he had under the Sphinx fight. Tremendous composure. And the thing that tells me that all of that composure was, was real was that when Mike fights, his level of confidence and his level of, uh, of composure is measured by what he does when he comes out for round one. If he comes out rather or a little reserved, it means that he's a little intimidated or a little concerned about the fight or the moment or the opponent. If he comes out winging shots, I know he's having fun and he's relaxed. And that's exactly what happened in the Sphinx fight. He came out for round one, and this is an interesting term. Some of the press, and especially Jim Jacobs, viewed it like when Mike fought, it's like when the bell rings for round one, he just scored a knockdown. And he's coming out to end the fight. That's the way Mike came out for round one. And that's why he was so exciting. And that's the way he came out for the Sphinx fight. So under all that pressure in the Sphinx fight, he still held it together incredibly well. Yeah, it was incredible. And how did you hear about Kevin Rooney being let go? Well, that was an interesting situation because Mike Tyson never let Kevin Rooney go, ever. Don King, of course was taking over Mike in that uh, late uh, 88. And he knew that the lawsuit against Bill was solid, that he Bill was not going to be around anymore. He knew that I work with Bill, therefore I'm not going to be around anymore. So he can control Mike's money. But there was still one more factor involved, Kevin Rooney. He knew Mike and Kevin were close, and that Kevin was the trainer. He knew, Don knew he had to get rid of Kevin because the first fight Mike had with Don King and Mike got his paycheck and paid Kevin his 10%, that paycheck would be very small. And Kevin would say to Mike, what's this? And, and Mike would say, well, that's your 10%. And Kevin would say, Mike, your purse should have been twice as big as this. So Don knew he could never have Kevin Rooney around because Kevin would tell Mike right from wrong. So Don King had to figure out a way of getting rid of Kevin. 
He couldn't tell Mike to get rid of Kevin. So what does he what does he do? Great idea. There was a writer in New York named Mike Marley, and Mike was on Kevin uh, on Don King's payroll, and Don told Mike Marley to write a letter, a, a news article in the Post saying that Mike Tyson fires Kevin Rooney, and that's exactly what Mike Marley did. He wrote the article. My, uh, Mike Tyson fires Kevin Rooney. Once it was in the paper, and once it was announced like that, Don went up to Mike, and all of Don's cronies went up to Mike and said, hey, it's a great idea firing Kevin Rooney. What do you have to pay him 10% for? You, you're the fighter. You don't need a guy like that. You, you're the man. And Mike went along with it. So Mike himself never, ever fired Kevin Rooney. It was calculatingly done by Don King, and it was brilliant because that's what kept Mike away from anybody and everybody in his past. Mm-hmm. And and you too, right? At the same and time. me too. And me too. That was that was the tough part, you know, to 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 know that you know you know. Let's put it this way: if Mike was being taken advantage of financially by Don, only financially, well, hey, not so bad. But Mike was a hero doing commercials on TV in eighty five, eighty six, eighty seven. Once Mike was surrounded by the the cronies, Don King's henchmen, Mike's demeanor went back to the street, and Don knew that would happen. That's what hurt me, because Mike's demeanor caused a lack of commercial endorsements. The commercial sponsors pulled away. Mm. All of the people, the police department ads, every, gone. Mike's demeanor is in the press. The press starting to accurately describe Mike as a thug again. That, that bothered me. So while Mike was losing tremendous amounts of money, that wasn't as bad as the way he was viewed by the press and the public. The way his statue was disintegrating, that's bothered me more. Yeah, and directly after the Michael Spinks fight, from a public perspective, he reached his apex, his absolute zenith of, of how great he looked and how great people assumed him to be. How good do you think he was in that fight if he was going against any of the other heavyweights in any other time period, including today? Is there any heavyweight who you think could have beat that Mike Tyson? Um, well, of course, the one guy that always comes up on the list is, is Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that the type of fighter that did best against Mike was the Ali type of fighter. Whether it was a, a James Quick Tillis or a Bone Kershaw Smith or a Tony Tucker, you know, they went the 12-round distance. Uh, and the type of fighter that bothered Ali the most was a, a small fighter coming in aggressively, like Sonny Banks or Doug Jones or Joe Frazier. The big difference is that the tall guys who fought Mike, in those fights, Mike won almost every minute of every round, going forward, chasing the guys out of the ring. The small guys who fought Ali, going forward, they rocked Ali. He got dropped by Sonny Banks. He got rocked by Doug Jones. He got dropped by uh, Henry Cooper in London. Mm -hmm. That's not a good indication when you're fighting a guy like Mike Tyson, who's 25 pounds bigger than those guys and hits harder than those guys. Mm -hmm. The question becomes one of emotional stability. Ali always fought at his absolute best every fight. Whether mm -hmm. the guys came in winging shots or not, he was fought his, his fight. Mike never fought great every fight. He fought almost great, not so great. You never knew what was going to happen with Mike. So depending on the status of the fight between Ali and, and Mike, that would have been a tough fight for Mike, emotionally. The first time. The second time, Mike would say, hey, the guy really is not a great puncher. I had a lot left. Every fight after their first match, I'd bet on Mike. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that fight did mark the end of the truly iron years. When we pick up this conversation with Steve Lott, we'll go over the downfall of a champion and watching him from the outside now as as Mike started associating himself with hangers on and overall negative people. Thanks for your time today and thanks for your memories, Mr. Steve Lott. I appreciate talking to you. Thank you very much for having me.